Hello everyone, we are here at the 2016 Economic Botany Meeting in Harlan County, Kentucky, where Tony Cunningham, the winner of the Distinguished Economic Botanist Award, has kindly agreed to do a small interview with us. So welcome Tony. Thank you. Um, you did your doctorate in South Africa, yeah. pioneered networking that eventually led to in part or a very large part to the Indigenous Plant Use Forum. Could you speak about some barriers doing that while apartheid was present? Okay, so maybe I could put it into some sort of context, U.S. context, mm -hmm. because um, you know, I think it must be, would have been something like trying to do ethnobotanical research in Alabama or Mississippi in the 1950s, you know, for some white guy from New York. <laughs> or probably worse, because the Cold War was on, um, South Africa was involved and there was all sorts of global geopolitics um, and it was under a sort of military security monolith that had been there since 1948. Um, so I started my field research in 1980 and you know, though there were you know, major difficulties because of institutionalized racism in South Africa. I'd say the most difficult part was probably when I started working in uh, 1986 on the medicinal plants trade because that was mainly urban. I was working in my home province, Guazulu Natal, and there were major conflicts going on, internal conflicts. Uh, there was a low intensity guerrilla war in Guazulu Natal between the ANC and Encarta. About 30,000 people died over a 10 year period. And I was working in traditional medicine markets in areas like Umlazi Township, you know, which were pretty dodgy, and you know, they were literally burning barricades and so on at the time and you know there were people followed by the security police um, in 1989 uh, when I was still doing that work David Webster an anthropologist who I knew and had worked in the same area that I did my PhD was assassinated by covert branch of the military so it was not an easy time but I th I'll just give one example you know which links working on conservation, which ostensibly just seems neutral, and working on the medicinal plants trade, which again seems neutral, ethnobotany. Well, conservation is all about land, and access to land, and access to resources on the land. And it's very political. And the medicinal plants trade, because it involves healers who themselves are influential, uh, became drawn, the, the healers, through a covert branch of the military being aware of the role of healers and um, belief systems in, uh, let's say, the Mau Mau in um, Kenya, in the struggle in Zimbabwe, f formed the South African Traditional Healers Association. It was actually formed by a covert branch of the military. And when I started the project in 1986, I went to a meeting of the National Youngers Association at a hotel in Durban, which was one of many associations, but it was Zulu traditional healers. And there was a Swazi healer with someone who clearly was someone from the security police. And they were under the guise of having a health insurance for traditional healers, formed a very, what became a big association with the newsletter. They took their representatives, you know, healers that were on their, you know, their board to meet the current Minister of Defence at the time, Magnus Milan. So it was highly political from something that on the surface is apolitical. It's nowhere, not the case. So I had to pass on information about what was going on to friends of mine that were in Conterio Cesare. And, um, you know, that's, it's, it, you know, it was a risky time. You know, <clears throat> it's difficult to imagine now. 
So, you know, in a way, that was the worst of times, but there also was the best of times. And the best of times is, you know, Ubuntu. It's, it's an expression in Southern Africa for, I guess, it's more than human kindness. It's, it's respect for people's humanity regardless. And, you know, that still, that is, it was very much part of much of the country, then it's a country of complete contradictions. It was then and it is now. So, this respect that you speak about, and also your conservation, it really comes through in your book, Applied Ethnobotany, People, Wild Plant Use and Conservation. Um, can, what was your inspiration? Can, yeah. How did you get inspired <laughs> to put those experiences into a book that's right. such a great help to students? Okay. It's a good question. So, I was working for a conservation department. Uh, there were plans for setting aside areas for an elephant conservation area, uh, which was close to an area where there'd been a forest station with um, pine trees. Both of those developments, forestry on one hand, commercial forestry, conservation on the other, none of them took local people's use of resources into account and the livelihood implications of alternative forms of land use. So I decided that would be a really interesting research topic. I really battled to find a place I could register that for any sort of degree because you know, people would say oh, that's anthropology, someone else would say it's botany. <laughs> Eventually I found someone at the University of Cape Town which was thousands of kilometers <laughs> away. He said okay I'll give you a place to sort of hang your hat and you'll just have to make your own way. And there weren't any manuals around. There was no mm -hmm. how to do it ethnobotany guide, particularly for the applied ethnobotany. Mm -hmm. So writing applied ethnobotany was writing the field book that I wished I had at the wow. time. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that. I know it's helped me and it's helped so many other students, so we appreciate oh, okay. that. Um, and it sounds like a big project. It was a big, are, yeah, it was a big project. Are there other projects, big or small, that you want to do or wish you had done yeah. and, and would like to do one day? Okay. Well, I'll give you one example. So, I've always had an interest in traditional crafts, basketry, textiles. It came from my grandfather and grandmother had a, a small but significant collection of African baskets, mainly from Southern Africa. This, one of them goes back to the 1890s, so very interesting and I grew up with that interest. So I spent 25 years um, on an unfunded labour of love with a, a co-author, Beth Terry, writing a book on basketry of Southern Africa, which co covered seven countries. But over the last, say, 25, 30 years, I've had the privilege of working in East Africa, working in West Africa, and seeing amazing baskets that are made in those parts of Africa that are totally different to ones that are made in Southern Africa. Some of those have disappeared and they're only in museums. I wish that I had the chance of doing a book on African basketry that is, covers the whole of Africa. Oh, wow. And one of the motivators is there's an excellent book on traditional stools in Africa. And I'm not sure if you know it, but Africa has the greatest diversity of traditional stools oh, wow. of any continent in the world. And I think that Africa has one of the greatest diversities of traditional basketry and a living tradition of that in That's most amazing. cases. So that would be a real wish for me. Well, look for that book coming. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been to various countries in Africa that you know very well for your, from your research. Other ones you'd like to expand to. You've been around the world in different places. Why do you live where you live? And how, how can you decide with so much diversity of places you've been to? 
Well, the short answer is there's no place like home. <laughs> but a, 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 a sort of corollary to that is so many people from all over Africa are migrant workers. You could be Ugandan, you could be Cameroonian, you could be from Somalia or Ethiopia, and there are people from all of those countries. Zimbabwe would be the prime example, working all over the world. Working all over the world for certain reasons, but really missing home, yeah. missing family, missing certain foods, <laughs> missing a sense of place. And the worst people to transplant would be ethnobotanists, because we link to culture, place, plants. So at the moment, I'm living in Australia, and I'm there because uh, for family reasons. The place where my, my children are, but I will be moving back to South Africa within three or four years and then I'll be home. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. I know I loved my time, my brief time there for a conference. It's a yeah. wonderful place. And so there's many students here, there's many students that will be watching and listening active on social media. Yeah. If you can give a brief piece of advice to students in SEB or ones that are thinking about joining economic yes. botany, yes. what would that be? Yeah. I would say think very carefully about what you would love to do. Don't look for the job first. Do what you would love to do and do it as well as you can. Because the job will come. Or maybe in my case the job won't come. I'll be talking this evening and I haven't had a real job which is you know the definition of a real job is you get a regular salary, you get paid leave, you know room for advancement, that sort of thing. I haven't had a real job since 1983. <laughs> I've worked off soft money and that's been enabled through forming networks through working with great people like Malcolm Hadley and Alan Hamilton in the WWF UNESCO Q People and Plants Initiative. Small bits of money cobbled together and then that ended and I think it's fair enough that you know programs should have a finite life. But regardless of that, I mean really for the last ten years I have still been able to survive and I have also, it's partly self-inflicted, I've chosen to avoid bureaucracy which I find quite a time consumer and I've avoided the trap that I've seen really brilliant colleagues fall into. So some of the most capable brilliant people end up as administrators and so I've chosen to be an applied problem solver working on ethnoecology or ethnobotany and I've not only survived, I've, I've thrived and I feel good that I've been able to, in a small way, <clears throat> make a contribution. And that's possible for, for anybody. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tony. I know students of SEB are the curious type. Everybody <laughs> has something they're passionate about and we hope that we can follow through with that also. Okay. Thank you for a good yeah. example. Andrew, thank you.